Was this the most disturbed family in America? This is the story of the Galvin family. The Galvin family was what you would expect any middle-class family to be like during the mid 20th century in Colorado Springs. At the start of their marriage in 1944, Donald and Mimi, the patriarch and matriarch of the family, didn't seem so different from many other wartime couples, with her already pregnant with their first child as he prepared to ship out to the Pacific. Back home after the war, he seemed moodier and more brooding than before, signs that combined with several hospitalizations over the years for attacks of nerves suggest that the brutal, high-casualty battles he'd fought had left him with what today would be called PTSD. Nonetheless, military life appealed to Donald, so he signed up for a career in the newly formed Air Force. Whether it was his Catholic faith or the couple's determination to fill their lives with children, one baby after another followed ten sons in a row before the arrival of two daughters. The Galvin family siblings are Donald Jr. James, John, Brian, Michael, Richard, Joseph, Mark, Matthew, Peter, Margaret, and Mary, who changed her name to Lindsay later in life. Mimi had longed for a sophisticated and intellectual life in the heart of New York City, but her husband's career took them to Colorado Springs. So she sublimated her dreams into painstakingly creating and molding a perfect family that was initially envied by the community. Donald Galvin taught at the Air Force Academy and his wife, Mimi Galvin, was a stay-at-home mom. The family was heavily involved in the Colorado Springs community and attended church every Sunday. In 1963, when they moved into a newly built split-level suburban home just outside Colorado Springs, they presented themselves to the world as a slightly expanded version of a 1950s domestic TV comedy centering on a bevy of bright, well-behaved kids. If anything made the family stick out other than its size, it was the family passion for falconry, domesticating and training feral birds for hunting. A hands-off father, even when he wasn't out of town, Donald called his kids not by their names, but by their number in the family birth order. Rather than punish or even just keep an eye on his rowdy sons as they habitually battered, wrestled, and injured one another, he bought them all boxing gloves. Sure, father. But she was just as oblivious to the extreme roughhousing, taunting, and bullying that neither parent seemed to worry about. Soon, though, the Galvin family would face an extraordinary challenge with six out of their 12 children diagnosed with schizophrenia. One tried to murder his wife by forcing her to inhale cyanide fumes. One shot his girlfriend dead, then turned the gun on himself and ended his own life. One molested his younger brother and sisters. One set fires and viciously attacked police officers, as well as patients and staff members in a mental hospital. It began with their oldest son, Donald Jr. He was the perfect son in his parents' eyes. He could do no wrong. He was a football star in high school and a wrestling star. He dated the general's daughter at the Air Force Academy. He seemed to have it all together, but he had known even in his teen years that something was off. He had a barrier between himself and other people. It got worse once he went off to college. While away at Colorado State University, Don Jr. began to exhibit disturbing behavior. First, he jumped straight into a bonfire. Then he slowly strangled a cat, Don Jr., a good athlete and average student, who was no trouble at all to his parents. They ignored the severe beatings he imposed on his younger brothers while growing up, had his first psychotic break before his last sibling was born. His illness became worse at college, and he was soon back in the parental home, separated from his wife. There was the time when Don Jr., without explanation, stood at the sink and smashed ten dishes to pieces. Another when he jumped straight into a bonfire. Another when he apparently killed a cat, slowly and painfully. Don Jr. sought out the health services at his university but was not given an official diagnosis. The family's only girls, Margaret and Lindsay Galvin, were prey to the brutish rough housing of their schizophrenic brothers. Mary would come home from school, for example, to find Donald Jr. transplanting every last piece of furniture out of the house and into the backyard or pouring salt into the aquarium and poisoning all the fish. Lindsay said, though, her parents tried to explain that her brother was sick she was five and too young to understand and just wanted him to go away. Typically, with the father Donald usually away on business and Mimi physically unable to pull her muscular and athletic sons apart, the youngest. Littlest kids knew the drill when trouble broke out. Cower in the master bedroom, door locked, pray their brothers wouldn't break through, and wait for the police to arrive. Don Jr. would not be given a definitive diagnosis until he tried to murder his wife. He was eventually sent to what was formerly the state mental hospital in Pueblo, where his behavior was finally given an explanation. Schizophrenia. Between the late 60s and early 80s, six of the Galvin brothers were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Donald Jr., James, Brian, Joseph, Matthew, and Peter. Brother number two, 
James, who also married very young, began hearing voices and attacking his wife. After he had seemingly recovered, the youngest children were often sent to stay with him when Don Jr. made their lives too chaotic or frightening. At first, when Don Jr. was beginning to decline, James seemed to have his life together. He married a girl named Kathy and had a son named Jimmy. But at home, Jim was starting to hear voices of people spying on him, following him, and people conspiring against him. He turned to alcohol and became violent to Kathy. Throughout this time, James sexually abused his sisters, who, as they later revealed, had been somewhat deadened to abuse because brother number four, Brian, had already molested them. While living in California, Brian dated a bright and cheerful girl called Noni for a while, but they broke up after several months. A month after their breakup, Noni was declared missing. The police found Noni and Brian's body on the floor next to a 22 rifle. Brian had shot Noni and then killed himself. While no records have been found of Brian's official schizophrenia diagnosis, the Galvin family learned that Brian had been prescribed Nevain, one of the many antipsychotic drugs that treat schizophrenia. The family tried to cover up the whole incident as an accident. In 1975, 15-year-old Peter had a psychotic break shortly after watching his father have a stroke before his eyes. Peter then began wetting himself when he was 14 years old because he thought the devil was under the house. Peter was known as an excellent math student and talented ice hockey player before becoming ill. Peter was prescribed so many antipsychotic drugs, up to eight, but nothing worked. In the end, the doctors acquired the court order for ECT, electric shock treatment. ECT is the use of electricity to induce a seizure and calm the brain. In mass media and popular culture, ECT is portrayed as medical torture and thought oppression. But interestingly, a lot of notable and accomplished figures have received the ECT treatment and have advocated for its efficacy. In 1976, it was the turn of Matthew 17, brother number nine. Matthew experienced a traumatic incident at a relatively young age when he was severely beaten by his brother Joseph, resulting in the need for brain surgery. Following this ordeal, Matthew spent time in different medical facilities and eventually found a home in a Section 8 apartment where he lived independently. Matthew, a promising and talented potter, paid a visit one day to a family friend to show them a vase he had made. While waiting in the living room, suddenly he ripped his clothes off and smashed the vase he had worked so hard on. Matthew also had the delusion that he was Paul McCartney of the Beatles. Each of the brothers' conditions displayed themselves in different ways. Where Don's psychoses were hallucinatory and delusional, Jim would self-harm because he was paranoid and depressed. There was the Thanksgiving where the perfectly set table, Mimi's last grip on normalcy, was completely toppled over in one of the brother's outbursts. Don Jr. picked up the dining room table and threw it at his brother James, sending the pressed linen plates and silver everywhere. The parents, ashamed and overwhelmed, tried to cope. As the years passed, Mimi became less successful in explaining away the growing chaos in her home that invariably spilled into the streets of her neighborhood. Meanwhile, her husband grew more emotionally and physically remote with each child they had together. By late 1978, there were three Galvin boys in different wards of the same state mental hospital. Four of the ten brothers did not have schizophrenia. Richard, Mark, Michael, and John. The last son to be diagnosed, Joseph, had troubled Peter's doctors years before while visiting his hospitalized siblings, but he seemed, if only relatively, fine to his family. But after a series of personal losses, he too began being overwhelmed by hallucinations in 1982 at age 25. Joseph, a once promising hockey player with a stable job in Chicago, experienced a sudden and devastating decline due to schizophrenia. Voices in his head led him to send a threatening email to his boss, resulting in his job loss. Joseph believed that he had lived in China in his past life and communicated to a Chinese emperor in the clouds. But out of all the Galvin boys who were diagnosed with schizophrenia, everyone agreed that Joseph was the most poignant in his suffering. He was the only one who could differentiate hallucinations and reality and was conscious enough to want things to stop. He also tried his best in keeping in touch with the family by sending birthday cards and presents. Joseph later told his mother that a family friend, a Catholic priest, to whom Don Sr. and Mimi had often entrusted their boys, had molested them. While Mimi revealed to her adult daughters, after they had confronted her about sending them to James, that she too had been sexually abused as a child by her stepfather. Lindsay eventually escaped the house and left home when she entered the ninth grade after she earned a scholarship to a boarding school. Mimi said that both she and her husband were deeply ashamed and felt they couldn't open up about what was going on to anyone, 
not the people who live next door, not even their closest friends. She didn't use terms like schizophrenogenic mother, but she did say that they were made to feel that they were at fault. To her, that may have been the primary thing. But a deeper factor was that their life felt like a house of cards. If her husband's prestigious job was in jeopardy because he was talking about having a volatile, mentally ill son at home, that would mean no income to support the other children. And there were a lot of children. While tending to all of her ill children and doing what she thought was best to keep them out of institutions, Mimi simultaneously avoids even acknowledging their erratic behavior. From her daughter Lindsay's perspective, to do anything else would be the same as admitting that she lacks any real control over the situation. Mimi loved her children, but was also unyielding in their pursuit of excellence. She was deemed something of a drill sergeant by many of the siblings. On March 2, 2001, James was found dead, with the coroner ruling his death as a heart attack caused by his medications. Out of the 10 boys, only four boys evaded psychosis, John, Michael, Richard, and Mark. After seeing his older brothers having their psychotic breaks one by one, John became fearful that he was going to be next. So he and his wife decided to move away from Denver. Today, he is a music teacher in Idaho. Michael narrowly managed to get away. During his teenage years, Michael had been prescribed Stelazine, an antipsychotic drug, and was two times admitted to hospital psychiatric wards for observation. Michael believed he wasn't crazy. His tipping point was when he learned to practice meditation and mindfulness. Richard became a mining investor in Denver. Mark was the only one of the Galvin's superb hockey team who was spared from schizophrenia. This revelation hit him the hardest. Margaret and Lindsay were the last girls of the Galvin family. Lindsay was sent away to live with Nancy Gary, a family friend, while Don and Mimi were struggling with her brother's schizophrenia psychosis breaks. In the end, her approach to dealing with the trauma was to have as little contact as possible. Lindsay, the youngest of the Galvin family, at first felt envious of Margaret. Unlike her, Margaret had a chance to get away from it all, and Lindsay was left alone to live with her older schizophrenic brothers. She felt she lost an ally. Lindsay also initially partly blamed her mother for all the trauma she went through during childhood. Lindsay managed to get proper help by consulting a therapist called Silvern. How did this family land here? And why, despite medications, hospitalizations, and therapy regimens, did all its members, those diagnosed with the disease and those free of it, remain trapped in the suffering? The World Health Organization estimates that about 1 in 100 people deal with symptoms of psychosis or schizophrenia, including hearing voices, delusional ideas, and constant feelings of being watched. Some experts champion shock therapy, others call for institutionalization. Some psychotherapists saw madness as a metaphor, and some doctors prescribed catatonia by tranquilizers. Perhaps most troubling of all, a generation of psychotherapists blamed the mother for causing the disease by either overparenting or underparenting. While an exact cause for the condition is not known, research suggests it involves abnormalities in brain chemistry and structure and can be caused by genetically inherited problems or issues that occur during a person's development. In short, the Galvin household offered a horrifically rich mine of potential evidence for any theory of schizophrenia's causes. And it did so at a time when psychiatry's nature versus nurture battle raged on, with many experts still holding to the schizophrenogenic mother explanation. That thesis, articulated by the influential German-American psychiatrist Frieda from Reichmann, tormented mid-century parents by blaming the disease on severe warp and rejection in infancy and childhood, as a rule, mainly from a schizophrenogenic mother. It didn't help that Mimi, a perfectionist averse to praising her children and secretly troubled by her own trauma, fit the false mother as bogeyman profile to a T. But if Mimi herself and the vast set of triggers that might have influenced her son's individual psychoses interested some psychiatrists, the basic Galvin arithmetic, six boys and one family, captured the attention of researchers seeking a physical cause by the mid-1980s, researchers had collected blood samples from the Galvins, which soon, unbeknownst to the family, became part of numerous studies. It was 2016 before the right test offered a breakthrough. Researchers worked with the DNA of only nine families, all of which had to have at least three individuals with schizophrenia and three without. The goal was to find a common genetic mutation, even if it was common only to a particular family, because that abnormality could indicate an overall biochemical pathway to schizophrenia. The study found it in all seven Galvin brothers who had provided blood in the Shank 2 gene, which encodes the proteins that help brain synapses transmit signals. 
It's not a smoking gun cause of schizophrenia gene, but it does offer the potential pathway the researchers sought, even as it raises this question. Why, when it's likely all the siblings have that mutation, did some develop serious mental illness and others did not? As the brothers ping between the state mental hospital and the family home, where their mother devoted herself to caring for them, the two girls of the family felt neglected and endangered. Yet as adults, the two women maintain their connections to their troubled clan, with Lindsay returning to nurse their ailing mother and helping her brothers negotiate the institutional bureaucracies that presided over their lives. Don Jr. and Matthew Galvin still live in Colorado Springs. Their father, Donald Sr., passed away in 2003. Mimi passed away in 2017. Peter died in his sleep in 2023. A book called Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family, and a Max documentary called Six Schizophrenic Brothers about the Galvin family are available to learn more about this story. This concludes today's story. As always, don't forget to subscribe to get more content. Until next time.